Today, I'm going to teach you how to bounce back from every failure, every setback, every rejection professionally. I'm going to give you a plan that will allow you to rise from the ashes every time. And it's already around you. Let's go. Helping you win at work so that you're winning in life. I'm Ken. This is the Ken Coleman Show. A lot of people have been laid off over the last year. If you haven't been laid off or fired, I'm, I've got some, some good news and bad news. We'll start with the bad news. You will be laid off. You will be fired. Statistically, at some point, it's probably going to happen. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is, is you can bounce back, and it doesn't have to be as painful as you think it does. Now, this is always a, a, a hot topic when we talk about it on the show, uh, certainly on social media. And so I just want to walk through some very strategic, practical uh, uh, strategies that if you put in place prior to getting laid off or fired, you're going to bounce back really quickly. And you could still employ these strategies if you're listening to me and watching me right now and you've been recently laid off or fired and you're in a season where you haven't bounced back. It's going to help all of you today. So the reality is, is this is a people-centric strategy. We need people. You've heard the old metaphor of if you're walking along and you see a turtle on the top of a fence post, you know one thing. He didn't get there by himself. I, any successful woman, any successful man, will tell you that it was people that helped put them where they are today. Did you have a lot to do with it? Absolutely. Absolutely but you didn't get here on your own. I didn't get here on my own. No chance. I'm standing on a lot of shoulders as I talk to you today. And so if it's true that we need people to get us to where we ultimately want to be, it's also true that we need people to pull us up out of the pit, to pull us up out of the ditch, out of the side of the road. We need people. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 basically tells us this. Two are better than one. You need people. And yet, sometimes when we think about that, we feel as though we're bothering people when we ask for help. Our pride rises up inside of us. And we're more worried about what they might think or say, and we don't ask for help. We just need to ask for help. We're so afraid to ask for help. Here's what I found in my life. When I go to people and I say, I need you, and here's why I need you, and here's what I'm asking you to help me do, I find that they're almost always extremely willing to help. I had a, a posture of humility and a posture of hunger. And that's very attractive. People find that attractive. But I'll tell you what they don't find attractive. In fact, not only do they not find it attractive, they, fa- they find it to be a repellent. And that is when you have zero relationship with them at all or you've not been in relationship with them for some time and you pop up out of nowhere and all of a sudden you need something. I had this happen to me recently. I don't know if you've had this happen to you. It happened happened to me. Uh, I got an email out of nowhere. And it was so out of nowhere and, and, and so much distance removed from the time we last communicated that the email started this way. I hope this is still your email address. <laughs> it, I mean, it's like a Hail Mary. You know, the last play in the football game when the quarterback backs up, throws it as high and as far as he can, he hopes that somebody catches it. It's one of those emails. Hey, Ken, I hope this is still your email address. Oh, boy. And then it goes on. Hey, hope you're doing great. Best I can tell, you're killing it, Ken. I'd love to connect real soon. Okay. You mean you just immediately start to go, what's this about? This is not a person who stays in touch with me on a regular basis. This is a person who's just lobbing a Hail Mary And now they've put all of the responsibility on me to go, what's really going on here? So what do I do? I agreed to do a call. Call starts. Hey, man, long time, no talk. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. And we exchange the niceties. We get a high-level catch-up. What are you doing? Here's what I'm doing, all this kind of stuff. And then it happens. The ask. Now, There's still a way to do that the right way. But all of the fake niceties, 
hey, I just want to connect. Spare me all that. Just tell me what it is that you want. But that's not the best way to go about it. That feels really slimy. It feels disingenuous. And compare that, contrast that to a feeling of appreciation. When someone says to you humbly, I'm in a tough spot. I need insight. I need wisdom. I need a connection. And here's why. And there's a relationship there. Does it mean we have to be best friends? No, it doesn't. I remember when I was a kid playing in the pool. And I remember the first time I got a beach ball. And like a lot of kids, you start to figure out this thing is buoyant. And you ever remember playing a silly game where you'd get that beach ball kind of underneath your legs and you would try to push that beach ball all the way down the bottom of the pool, but it inevitably popped out from between your legs, you know, or it threw you upside down. What I'm going to teach about, this concept here allows you to, A, never stay down. But so many people, when when rejection, when a layoff, when getting fired happens, they never come back out of the cave. Because initially you, you're, you're put in this cave of rejection. We know from data that that when laid off or fired, it has the same psychological effect as losing a loved one. It's profound. And so we naturally retreat to lick our wounds to get healthy. But when opportunities aren't available, and even more importantly, when we don't have a connection framework to be able to find other opportunities, we stay in the cave. And this is life-threatening stuff. You are then forced to rely on others to support you. You are in isolation. You are forced to take something that you really don't enjoy. And the spirit, the soul, the heart never recovers from that. So this is a devastating loss in your life, and you never recover, as opposed to coming out of the cave going, hey, that was a rough season, but the storm is over. The sun is out. Joy comes in the morning. I've got something else that I can go after, and I recover, and and I'm not walking around in shame. I'm back out. I'm back on the horse. Pick the metaphor that you want, and I'm back at it again. All of that happens When we have a community, some would call it a network. I like to call it a community, a community of people that I have been intentional with so that when something bad happens, I don't feel awkward to pick up the phone and call them and even in tears if it is the situation, even if it is the most vulnerable, weak state that you've been in some time for you to go, this just happened to me today. I need your help. That's when people step up because, number one, they know you. Number two, they care for you. And number three, they have the ability to help you. So coming up, how do we build that community or network to where we are recession-proof, layoff-proof, fire-proof? I'm going to tell you. I learned about it when I was 17, and it changed my life. know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, that's your talent, the work you love to do, that's your passion, and the results that matter to you, your mission. Then you'll feel more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash clarity. Hey, if you're enjoying this show, I would love for you to help us grow. If you're watching via YouTube, you can do that by giving us a thumbs up on the video you're watching, subscribing to the channel, and then sharing with someone. And same on the podcast side of things, your favorite app. Follow us, give us a five-star review, and share. Thank you very much. All right, let's continue. So how do we build 
a healthy network, I would like to call it a community, how do we build this so that the most unexpected thing that would happen to us professionally, and by the way, this has personal context as well, but we're going to talk primarily about the professional context here. So I lose my job, I get laid off, or I I wake up one day and uh, the company I work for, it's too much. Maybe it's the culture, maybe it's the leader, maybe it's coworkers. Let's throw that scenario in there, okay? So we got I got fired. Maybe I did something wrong. Maybe there was a disagreement, whatever. Then I get laid off. That's largely about cutting costs. And let's say you get to your breaking point where you go, I got to quit. I can't do this anymore. All right? Those are your three scenarios. So how do you walk into those realities and walk out on the other side, not taking a massive financial hit because you had to burn through savings? Even worse, you use credit cards to get through it. This is the reality. It's what people do. Well, how do you do that? How do you get back up on your feet? Because it is absolutely getting knocked off the horse, right? Just get completely thrown off. How do we get back up? So I'm going to walk you through that. When I was 17 years of age, I've got the book here in the studio, and I took the, the dust jacket off because I, it, sits on the, it sits on the shelf most days behind me. Uh, but I pulled it off the shelf today because I'm going to share some content out of this book that I learned when I was 17 years of age, and it has absolutely delivered for me what I'm going to tell you that it will deliver. It has made me fireproof. It has made me recession-proof. It has made me failure-proof. The book was bought for me by my father when I was 17. I had just graduated high school, and the book is Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Harvey McKay is the author. It became a best-selling book, and Harvey... Uh, was a, uh, and still is, a very successful entrepreneur. He was in the envelope business. Of all businesses, the guy sold envelopes, all right? And so uh, the book was Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty, and if you don't understand the title, I'll explain it to you. The idea here is, with the metaphor of a well, you want to dig the well, make sure it's functioning, so that when you need water, it's working, right? And so the whole idea is, when I need something, in life, and I'm really in a place of need, I better have dug the well or else I'm out of luck because I'm thirsting, I'm in a dangerous situation, and I have no source of water. So in this metaphor, the source of water, the water is the relationships, the connections that I have, the network that I have developed. And I can rely on that when I'm thirsty, when I need it. And so the digging of the well is the art, and I mean art, of connecting with people. Okay, so anyway, that's the source of the book. I highly recommend it. It's as relevant today as it was those many years ago. So a couple things I just pulled out. Some of my favorite advice from the book that I think will really help you dig that well so that if you're laid off, fired, or you can't stay where you are any longer, here's what you do. Number one, don't rely on any corporation, any organization for job security. Don't put those emotional eggs in their basket. Well, you know, I'm working for Google. I'm working for Microsoft. I'm working for Salesforce. I'm working for big companies, Redfin, huge real estate company. Oh, yeah? Well, guess what? Those companies that I just named have been in the news for some of the biggest layoffs in the last year and a half. How do you like those big companies now? The bigger the company, the more of a unit of production you become because it's based on stock price. They're about profitability, not loyalty. Remember that. So don't put your eggs in the basket of your organization. Well, it's a really healthy company. They're a really big company. Blah, 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 blah. Listen, that doesn't mean anything. That's not where your job security comes from. So this is about mindset. That's what I took away from that. As a 17-year-old, I'm going, it's got to be about me. I've got to be able to rely on me so that no matter what happens, I can pivot and win. How do you do that? Relationships. Relationships. 
to when you're in a big company? How many people are you friends with in that big company? How many people from different departments or divisions? That's just you start there. Let's just start where we are. They may move on to another company, and if you stayed in touch with them, you developed real friendships where you are as people move on, guess what? They stay your friends if you stay in contact with them. Now, am I saying you got to send an email or a text every week? No, but I'm saying within reason, you develop real relationships at work. By the way, this is my big beef with a lot of these people on social media. It's become very popular to go on social media, TikTok, and, and Reddit and go, I don't want to be friends with anybody at work. I want to leave work at work. Okay, all right, that's just stupid. You're going to spend the majority of your life at one place and not develop friendships and relationships? I think it's crazy. Second thing I learned, not only is a network good for me with relationships and opportunities attached to all these people I know, guess what? A great network, a great community makes me actually look better than I am. Early on, I benefited from working for John Maxwell. I was 27 years of age when I went to work for John Maxwell, who even then was an icon, a legend. And I met so many people because I worked with John. And years later, I looked better than I was. I looked more valuable than I was because I knew all these really impressive people. Now, that does not mean you become a serial name dropper. Nobody likes that. I've been guilty of that before. Got to be careful. That self-promoting and name dropping can be ugly. But my point is... When I'm in conversation and I'm connecting with other people and they realize, well, what do you do now? Well, I work for John Maxwell. Oh, still happens to me. I work for a unicorn right now, an icon, a Hall of Famer, Dave Ramsey. I meet people all the time. I was in Las Vegas recently for a big basketball leadership networking event. I went out there just for that. I was in 24 hours in and out. Meeting and I'm meeting all these coaches and NBA players and it comes up, oh, you work for Dave Ramsey? <laughs> makes me look good. Why? Association. So don't don't miss that. That was a huge lesson for me. Third, my network can help other people. It's not just about me. And this is the real reward. This is the real reward. This happens to me, I'll bet you, three or four times a week. I'll get a call from somebody who knows somebody, and they know that I know that somebody, and they go, hey, would you make a connection over there? Or somebody I'll be talking to, and they'll say, hey, I'm interested in this and this and this, and I'm going, hey, I can make a connection for you. And so your network actually becomes of tremendous use for other people. I got to tell you, one of the easiest asks for me is to call one of my best-selling author friends or a CEO friend and go, hey, I was talking to so-and-so the other day. You don't know him, but this is the situation. Would you be willing to talk with them or help them out? Man, I love that. See, I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for someone else. That's a beautiful thing about being really connected. Number four, build a network of gatekeepers. Now, this is enormous. Probably my favorite lesson from the book. If you want to get to Dave Ramsey, you better figure out how to get to his assistant. Period. End of story because you aren't getting to Dave. You just aren't. Unless you go to his assistant or somebody like me. I have people all the time reach out going, hey, would you mention this to Dave? I'm very selective, very careful. But there are times where it's a credible, legit thing, and I'll ask Dave, you want to talk to them? Gatekeepers. Someone who's close to that person you really want to get to. Their assistant, a mutual friend. You talk about opportunities opening up. This is huge. What's the lesson? It's your network of relationships that make you unstoppable. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? You're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. If you need to make a move, you'll even get practical next steps to keep you moving forward. Listen, stuck is a choice, and life is too short not to do what you were created to do. To take the quiz, go to kencoleman.com slash quiz. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. If you are feeling stuck, you feel like you know what you want to do, but you don't know how to get there, or you're feeling uncertain, several ideas, not sure which one to pick. 
I've got a great resource for you that is wildly popular. It's called the Get Clear Career Assessment. It is an awareness tool that makes you aware of what you do best. That's your talent. Think of those as your superpower tools that allow you to do work excellently and efficiently. And then it helps you identify the work that brings you joy. We call that passion. And then it identifies the results in the world of work that motivates you to get fired up and get out of bed. Nobody has to get you fired up. Motivation is is not something I can do for you. You can only do it for you. And we call that missional results. So it identifies what you do best, what you love to do, and results that matter to you. And it gives you a purpose statement that now can become a compass for you to figure out how to get unstuck or how to choose that certain path, certain path. So it's called the Get Clear Assessment, KenColeman.com slash assessment, KenColeman.com slash assessment. You can get it there. Let's go to Ashburn, Virginia. Erica joins us for a coaching session. Erica, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Um, big fan. I'm so happy I'm able to talk to you directly. So oh, thank thanks you, Erica. A lot. You bet. How can um, I help? I am overwhelmed in a ha- on a hamster wheel, and you were just talking about emotional eggs in a basket. Yeah. I'm there. <laughs> so um, I was uh, given the opportunity at my job to um, – my job went away and I was offered two opportunities. One was a a steady option that was there and ready. And then another one was waiting to be uh, approved by upper management. I took the one that was there and ready. It was a good opportunity at the time. I thought I had done my pros and cons. I was looking more at work-life balance and not at money. I thought I was doing the right thing. And then reality hit. And I had been working like a young Hebrew slave. Mm. I am so tired. My work-life balance has actually gone off the hinges. I took my kid to school last Friday to college, and I was working at the same time. I was on uh, on the phone with work while I was taking him to college. Mm. So um, the problem is the other job has not been uh, the other job has not been hired for. Mm-hmm. Somebody came to me and said, hey, if you had it all over to do again, would you have taken the other job? I'm like, well, maybe, but who's to say that that wouldn't have worked out? I don't know what to do. I'm kind of stuck. I'm in my mid fifties. Change Mm -hmm. at this point is unrealistic because I've got a Mm. kid in college. I'm trying to look at retirement. Yeah. I don't know what to do at this point. I I'm tired of reinventing myself. I kind of wanted to just coast to retirement Mm -hmm. or until I won the the lottery. Well, (laughs) I don't know what to do. (laughs) Well, you're probably not going to win the lottery. Can we admit that? So let's (laughs) remove that from our heads. Um, Have you talked with your bosses? It feels like you have, and they didn't give you much of an answer. Am I right or wrong? No, because I think my situation helps them, and and they don't want to have to go through finding somebody else to replace me if I were to leave or go to another position. Okay, so you haven't talked to them to say, hey, guys, I'm overwhelmed. I said yes to this promotion, but you haven't filled the other position, and I'm drowning. You haven't had that? I talked to them. I, I talked to them and they were like, just sitting back and listening. They provided no advice or no direction. But did you tell them you were drowning? Yes. 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 I told them that the the major concern that I had about taking the job has actually manifested itself. And they and said. And all they could say was, I'm sorry. And and what about the other, are they going to fill your former position? What's the, What's their comment on um, that? Well, my former position went away, but the other one that um, was potentially offered to me, it got approved, and they haven't found a good fit for it yet. And I'm like, I can't really leave what I'm doing now to go over to this other job. It, they're in the same the same department and everything. Gotcha. So the way it would look, and it, it just it, it wouldn't be yeah. a good look. Right. Well, here's the thing. I don't know that you have to reinvent yourself to leave this place because here's the deal. There are two realities. Number one, it doesn't appear as though your leaders are looking to alleviate what's going on with you. It is what it is. They've put you in that position, and they don't seem to be empathetic or compassionate at all. So that means it doesn't seem like that's going to change. And what I also know as a reality is you can't continue to keep this up. I, the, the emotion in your voice, you are fried. Mentally, you're fried. 
emotionally and probably starting to get that way physically. Probably is affecting your health in multiple ways, maybe your sleep. Is this true? Oh, my God, yes. I haven't worked out in about two weeks, and literally last night I got online and worked on email from 10 to 2 o'clock in the morning. You can't do this. Up by 4. So you know you can't keep this up. No. So do you agree that I've framed the two realities very well? Yes. Okay. So that means there's only one thing to do here, and that means you are looking for something else. This is still a very good job economy. And I don't think you have to look at it through the lens of, I've got to reinvent myself. I've got to go get a degree. I've got to do all. No, you just need to change locations. We need to simply look at it as, I've got to be in a job that's paying me the same amount of money I'm making now or more as a bonus. And I'm in a, I'm in a healthy environment. And I've got a lot of skill. I've got a lot of experience. And I just need a healthy environment to finish up my work life. Based on what you've told me, that's what needs to happen. These this these leaders aren't going to change. Now, you've got two ways you can go about this change. You can just start looking for something, and that'll help your mindset, and you do your best to just get through. Don't work yourself silly. Communicate to them the whole time. I can't do this. See, I think they're afraid to lose you. I think, I think they have to listen to you if you put them in a situation where you don't hold them hostage, but you go, I can't keep doing this. You guys need to tell me. Some of these plates have to drop. Right now, I'm answering email till 2 in the morning, and I can't keep catching the plates falling off the cupboard. At some point, i got to drop a plate. You all tell me which plates you want me to let fall. I think you got to do that see how they react, because I don't think they want to lose you. Is that true? I, I think that's very true. So we're playing a little bit of poker here. Gentlemen's poker. I enjoy a great poker game. <laughs> uh, I do. I really do. And, uh, I'm not good at poker. That's our, no, but I'm teaching you how to be a poker player. So you're going to present a strong hand. And the strong hand is exactly what I just said. Guys, I spoke to you X amount of weeks ago, and I tried to tell you I was dropping, that I thought plates were going to drop. This is my reality. I was up 4 in the morning. I was working the entire time I took my kid to school. I signed up for this position. I get it. But I can't keep doing this. I'm going to be a disservice to you if I burn out, if I fray out. I need your help. Help me prioritize. What am I supposed to be spending my time on? Get them involved. That's the one shot you've got. That's the poker move. You're betting strong that they need you, and they see that you're in deep trouble. So they want to keep you. That's the bet. And you told me you think that's the right bet. Yes? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here's my deal. It doesn't change anything I said. It just means we take one more shot and we see if they're willing to help you, to give you okay. a break, and let's see if it gets better. If they don't help you or the way they offer to help you is just a Band-Aid only, you know what happens to Band-Aids after two or three days, don't you? They start peeling off. Come on. And so now we know. We now know this is not the place for me. And I would start looking, by the way, while you're doing all of this. I'd start looking. And you know what you bring to the table. You don't have to reinvent yourself. And by the way, change is coming, Erica. You know it and I know it. It is a train. It is a runaway train. It is on the way and you can't stop it. It's either going to be forced on you or you're going to choose it. Do you agree with that? Yes. Absolutely. So I always want to choose change, not let change choose me. That's my role. That's how I roll. And, and I'm not going to be on the other end of that train running me down. <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm getting out of the way. The train is coming. And it's and, I, and I'm going to get out of the way, not let it run me over. And so I've given you two very practical ways to do that. Have the conversation. Tell them where you're at and let them react. Start looking. And you decide. You see the train coming. And only you can tell when it's going to get there. Don't be standing in the middle of the tracks when it rolls through, please. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. 
This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. As a man of the people, it is my job to keep you up to date with what's going on. There's so much stuff reported in the news. We have more information coming at us than ever before. And so I try to keep you up to date on the trends at work, what's going on, what could affect you and your livelihood, your ability to earn a living. And so uh, in my hand, uh, this is a bit of good news if, if we behave properly. This is a huge caveat. I'll explain in a second. Wall Street Journal article headline, pay raises are finally beating inflation after two years of falling behind. On the surface, good news. But you, the American worker, will decide if this is actually good news. Americans growing paychecks surpassed inflation for the first time in two years. Inflation-adjusted average hourly wages rose 1.2% in June. That's year over year from last June. This according to the Labor Department. That marked the second straight month of seasonally adjusted gains after two years. If this trend continues, it gives Americans leeway to propel the economy through increased spending. That's me hitting the brakes. I brought my own sound effects today, guys. It's the best I can do, guys, on short notice. Hit the brakes. Now, this is conventional thinking. And what does conventional thinking lead us to? I'll tell you. Conformity. Conventional thinking, that's the way everybody does it. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. Okay. That leads to destruction. Financial destruction. Spiritual destruction. Physical destruction. Meant that, like, we just do what everybody else does, and we just accept we're just conformist, and we're like the little mice following the Pied Piper off the edge of the cliff. So here's a reporter just writing, hey, if this trend persists, if people start, if wages are outpacing inflation, people have more money to spend. Woohoo! It's good for the economy. No, it isn't, because credit card debt is at an all time high. Six figure earners are living paycheck to paycheck. We've been going through increased wages for over two years. It's part of what drove inflation. So you can't look at this and be like everybody else and go, oh, this is good news, Ken. Thanks for sharing. I think I'll head on down to Best Buy and get myself a TV. That's what we do. There's a lady on the front row smiling. She knows. I'm right. I mean, I'm. by the way, I'm not immune to this. I'm a human. What happens when we humans get a little jingle in our pocket? You know? I remember my granddaddy used to say, don't let that money burn a hole in your pocket. And I never knew what he meant. Was, you know, no kid, by the way, ever knew what that phrase meant. But that's what your grandparents said to you back in the 80s. I'm old. Some of you millennials and Gen Z have no idea. have never heard that phrase in your entire life. Don't let money burn a hole in your pocket. What they were saying was is, hey, hold on to it. Keep it. Save it. So this is what the phrase should say. If the trend persists of wages and the increase in wages outpacing inflation, this will give Americans leeway to propel the economy through saving. Now, let me just explain this idea. If we, the people, are making more money and we decide to save more, guess what happens? It means we reduce our spending And guess what happens when we reduce spending? Thank you for asking. Economics 101 coming up. Demand decreases. What happens when demand decreases? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Prices drop. What happens when prices drop? I save more money in my spending, and that boost the economy in a positive way. Oh, by the way, guess what else happens? Inflation drops. (gasps) 
crazy how that works. And yet our feckless Fed chair, Jerome Powell, only knows one tactic, and it has worked, sort of, and that's raise interest rates. But his goal was to raise interest rates to lower income increases, and it's not working. And I said it wouldn't work, and I'm not a fancy economist, but I do understand fifth grade math. That's about the level that I top out at. But that's all that's needed. So here's the deal. Inflation is dropping. That's good. But it is only good if we the people slow spending as inflation drops. It's going to be good for everybody. We are the economic engine, not D.C. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. If you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is the time to showcase how you are the best choice for the role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just some intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. Go to KenColeman.com slash interview. All right, folks, uh, I've got a fun uh, viral story that has to do with layoffs and our culture as a whole. And I think this is going to encourage a lot of you. So hang with me on this. I'm going to show you something that, that went viral recently, and it's it's all about trolls. So this, this, this segment's going to be chock full. I'm going to take on the trolls. I'm going to show you a great response that someone gave about getting laid off, high-profile person, by the way. And then I'm going to tie it into all of us and how we see ourselves and our self-worth related to our income and the work that we do. Because this is coming from a guy who believes we were created to work, period. And there's tremendous purpose in our work. So here's the story. Uh, if you didn't pay attention to this, and, and you know a lot of news out there, ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, laid off a lot of people a couple weeks ago, many of which were big-time personalities, well-known coaches, celebrities, and they laid them off because ESPN's struggling. I'm not going to cover that today. But if you're looking for what I think about ESPN's layoffs, I'll give you a little nugget. You can search uh, my show when I talked about Target and Bud Light. That's all I'm going to say. I'll let you go research that. When you get away from doing the thing you're supposed to do, you go broke. And you know why I watch ESPN? I watch ESPN for sports. I don't want to see politics and social issues shoved in my face. I want to see the highlight of the guy ripping the rim off the backboard. That's what I want to see. You know what I'm saying? That's what I want to see. I want to see the top 10 plays. I don't want to see the top 10 social issues that you're forcing down my throat. All right. Back to the article. Sorry, a little commercial break there, all right? And by the way, if you think I'm crazy, I'm not. It's not about politics. It's about the product, the service that you offer people. People go to Target for a loofah to scrub their back. That's why they go to Target. People bought Bud Light because they want cheap, awful beer. That's it. And you get outside of that, your customer's going to go, I'm not interested. Oh, this is just... You know, what? what is the purpose? Is the purpose to be political or is the purpose to solve a problem? I'm just telling you, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people that want cheap, awful beer, and whoever provides it to them without making a political statement is going to win. It's just, it's just a fact. All right. So here we go. So ESPN is struggling. They're hemorrhaging. Why? Because ESPN is all about Social issues these days. They forgot what it was about. Guys like me want to watch highlights. All right? That's the bottom line. I grew up on SportsCenter. It was the best hour of my life when I was a teenager. All right. Former SportsCenter anchor, Ashley Brewer, was a part of ESPN's latest round of layoffs last month, and she discussed the matter in a recent TikTok video, to which some internet troll, some loser who has nothing going on in their life, that they jump into her TikTok mentions and take a shot at her. 
And this is what the idiot said. Some loser dude who needs to make everyone else feel awful about themselves so he feels better about his pathetic life. She's on her honeymoon when she announces that she's been laid off. This clown goes in and says, for now, when you're on your honeymoon, real world doesn't exist. Once you get back home and you realize you have nowhere to go and reality sets in, blah, blah, blah. Just nasty. So it caught some attention and she highlighted it. So this is what this is what she said. This is her response. I want to show this video and then we'll come back. Watch this. I live by this quote. Never let your happiness be determined by something you may lose. In life, nothing is guaranteed. You can lose relationships. You can lose jobs. You can lose homes. My happiness will never be determined by a job or by being an ESPN Sports Center anchor. I have always... Um, felt like so much more than that it this job was never my identity uh i enjoyed it it was so much fun i used to always say it was the best job ever but my life and happiness and say depression would not depend on losing a job i pray to god that no one else that got laid off is depressed by this i pray that none of my followers are depressed when they lose a job because you are so much more than a job and i know that and i know when this job was taken away from me that God was redirecting me towards something else. It appreciate all of the kind words, the support. You guys have been amazing. That's all I'll say about it. Thank you. All right, so so just a very gracious response to some troll. So I want to talk about just I gotta I gotta spend a minute on 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 those of you that have experienced someone taking a shot at you online. We were talking about this in in a in a meeting today. We live in a day and age where we have a lot of people who've grown up with a smartphone in their hands. They've grown up on Facebook. They've grown up in chat rooms. And listen, this is this is important because I didn't grow up on that. And so I grew up in a world that if I was going to criticize somebody and go after them, there were consequences. If I took on somebody and said something nasty to them, I might get slugged right in the nose. Now, I know some of you snowflakes can't picture a world where you mouthed off and got in somebody's face and they hauled off and and just jacked you up. I mean, knock you on your butt. I watch all these videos and stuff of these people at protest and people being nasty, getting up in somebody's face, and they have the same First Amendment right that you do, and I would protect both of you whether I disagree with you or not. I think you should all be able to get there. But this idea we get in pe- people's face, that only happens in that format. Those are people that are dealing with rage. Well, back in my day, you did that. Let me tell you something. You'd walk away with a nose that had been readjusted. We live in a day and age now where you can go online and you jump into a a sweet sports center anchor. She's not hurting anybody. She's just sharing that she got laid off and she's going through and sends something positive and some troll gets in there and he's got to take a shot at her. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we have so many people who feel bad about themselves that they want to take a shot at anybody else. And they do it with zero consequence because when someone attacks you, by the way, I get attacked all the time. They come in, I post something on Instagram, and I'm just posting an opinion piece, and someone wants to take a shot at me personally, I laugh that stuff off. I, I don't focus on it. But the bottom line is people can do that now because they're on a keyboard, and I'm not in front of them. Watch how brave they would be if I were in front of them. And I'm not an intimidating guy. The people wouldn't do it. So that's part of the problem. Is people taking attacks and attacking, attacking, attacking with no consequence. It's pretty interesting. Now, her response is great. Her response is great. Some of you have been laid off. Some of you have been fired. And if you're not careful, you will take so much of your personal identity and self-being and you will attach it to the job and the circumstances by which the job was taken. And it's real, and it happens all the time. So I'm just going to be very transparent with you. In my particular job, you all are watching me, you're listening to me, you know that I am, in fact, the product. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a programmer. I am the product. Now, that's just the nature of what I do. I care deeply about the people that I get a chance to talk to. I care deeply about my philosophy. I care deeply about the methodology. 
I have worked on this stuff for years and years and years. It is personal. The reason that I help people discover what they are supposed to do with their life and do it to the best of their ability is because I was in a season where I was totally confused about it after having one very clear direction, and it rocked my world for three years, and it almost took me out. So I care deeply about this problem. I love writing books. I love giving keynote addresses. I love doing this show live. I love going on Fox News yesterday and, and, and the week before. I love it. I love all of that. I love coaching people more than anything I do. I enjoy commenting on stories. I love what I do, and I'm known for doing it. But can I just tell you something? I'm Stacy's husband of 25 years. I'm dad to Ty, Chase, and Josie. I'm the son to Ken and Barbara. That's right, the real-life Ken and Barbie. Hey, I'm friends too, and I could go on and on and on. What I do matters deeply to me, but I am more than my job. I'm more than my role. So those of you that are going through this right now, you still have tremendous value. You matter, and you have what it takes. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.